Okay, we're going to start a new topic, a new little mini-series, if you will, um, on this issue, which is a central one in our culture today. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about a lot of different facets uh, of this topic of abortion and how Christians view it, how the world views it, and the argument that is going on currently uh, in our culture about these things, and even amongst Christians about these things. Uh, I've noticed in my um, studies of this topic that very often with the Christian people who talk about this topic, they don't, want, they don't often bring up the passages that are used by the opposition for the pro-choice arguments, for the, for the pro-abortion um, side. And then those pro-abortion videos, there are plenty of videos out there of people who either claim to be Christians or just claim to know the Bible, that claim that the Bible is pro-abortion, that the Bible is pro-choice, etc. Those people um, never uh, use the verses that, we use, that the uh, pro-life people use, uh, at least not all of them, that you can go across YouTube and look up the videos for both sides, and rarely are you going to get a really comprehensive look at all of the verses that are uh, in play um, on this topic, that both sides uh, very often, it's, <laughs> I, I, it sounds, especially the atheist side, tends to straw man our side, which means makes our side look much weaker than it actually is doesn't use the passages that are the most strong for the pro-life case. Um, but, but there's Christians that do that as well, that, that fail to um, present the op- opposing side in its strongest form, or steel man that side. So all I want to do today in the first podcast, in the first video here for those of you watching, is just lay out um, all of the relevant passages to this topic. Now, um, th- there's, a few, there's a lot of facets of this, of this argument, but I, I think the key question uh, is whether or not the um, being inside of the womb is life, and if it's human life. Um, so I'm, we're not looking at passages here that establish the value of human life. I'm kind of assuming you agree with me on that, that you agree that it's wrong to kill humans. Uh, that may be an leap on my part, but I'm assuming that you agree that human life is valuable, um, and that taking human life Taking innocent human life is wrong, whatever that means to you, that it is sinful, that it's wrong, that we shouldn't do it, that human life is valuable, and therefore taking human life is wrong. And so I'm I'm assuming that sort of premise. The premise we're looking at here, the passages we're looking at, are passages that deal with the aliveness, the value then of the being inside of the womb, whether or not that being is valuable like a human is, and therefore taking its life, therefore also wrong. Okay, so I just want to look at it across... All the passages that are used, I've looked at a bunch of atheist sources, read some um, books from the opposing side, or looked at books from the opposing side, and and looked at the main passages that are used. In fact, really all the passages that are used to try to argue that um, God is at least okay with abortion, or doesn't see life inside the womb as as valuable as outside the womb. So I'm not going to do a lot of editorializing today in this video. I'm not going to really argue anything. All I want to do is present to you, smart thinking people, um, the verses that are in play, and the only comments really being to help you understand why these verses are relevant to the topic. And then I'll come back in later videos and we'll we'll kind of get into the arguments themselves from the different points of view. So I just want to present to you with the passages and let you begin thinking on these things and see how all of them um, kind of play into the idea. Okay, first, Luke chapter 1 verses 41 and following, and I just put on the slides here the most relevant parts. There, there's The whole section is in a lot of these uh, relevant. But in Luke 4, 1, 41, we have Elizabeth and Mary um, coming together for the first time. Elizabeth with child with John the Baptist, Mary with child with Jesus. And we have this, verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby, John the Baptist, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. The reason this is relevant is uh, maybe obvious, but because we have a baby inside the womb who's responding emotionally. So it seems to be taking on these personal attributes of responding with joy, even though it has not yet been born. This is a baby inside the womb that's responding, uh, and that is that is acting in this way. Okay, Psalm 51, verse 5, David says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Sinful from the time, or my mother conceived me in sin. Uh, but since the context is about David and his own sin, not his mother's sin, it's thought by most scholars that David is referencing his own sinfulness um, even from the time that he was conceived. That 
So it's relevant because it's David identifying himself as a morally responsible individual all the way back to conception. Psalm 139 verse 13 says, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Okay. Genesis 25, 22 and following, The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant, and the babies jostled each other within her. Here's the story of Jacob and Esau, and these babies are in the womb struggling with each other. Okay, they're Esau and Jacob are fighting with each other, already identified in this passage as Jacob and Esau, right, as personal individuals. They are fighting together in the womb. Okay, so that's, um, I guess, obvious why it's relevant. We have these passages, a few passages, which are kind of parallel passages. In Isaiah 49, the first one, where Isaiah says, Before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. He has spoken my name. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, etc., etc. So we have Isaiah referencing Christ's or God's um, action on him before he was born. And that personal identification of Isaiah, he was already Isaiah in the womb. That's the idea. And then we have the same thing with Jeremiah in chapter 1. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And the same thing from Paul in Galatians 1. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased, etc. So we have these kind of three passages with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Paul who all um, see themselves as being identified as themselves even when they were in the womb before they were um, born. Also in Luke chapter 1, after um, the baby has leapt in the womb of Elizabeth, we have, in a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you, said Elizabeth to Mary, among women, and blessed is the child you will bear, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Uh, the reason that's relevant is because Elizabeth refers to Mary as the mother of the Lord at, the, at, at this, basically, moments after um, Jesus is conceived, right? There is the Immaculate Conception that Mary is already referred to as the mother of the Lord far before he is born, before even we've gotten to the point where he would have a heartbeat or those things, but is already, already referred to as the mother of Christ um, when he has just barely been conceived, that he is already uh, in a position to have a mother, right, to be called, uh, in that sense, to, to be able to call one mom and to be able to, for her to be able to call him her son before he is born, in fact, long before he is born, uh, simply right after conception. So uh, the, the thinking there on this verse is that um, Christ the incarnation doesn't occur at birth or when he's 12 or when he's 30, that the incarnation occurred at the moment of conception, that he became flesh at the moment of conception is the idea there. Um, maybe the most significant passages, passage is Exodus 21, 22 and following, which says, When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall be surely fined. But if there is harm, you shall pay life for life. Very controversial verse that we'll spend some time on in a future video. The reason is because the Hebrew is kind of ambiguous and is translated differently by by different numbers. Like you'll see some versions, most famously the NIV, which says, um, so that her children miscarry. It doesn't say so that her children come out. The, the large majority of passages don't use the word miscarry because it, it does just say that the children come out. And so premature birth it seems to be more at play here, um, etc. So... Regardless, we'll look at that in the future. But what we have here is this idea of men fighting, not fighting the woman, but they're fighting, and they hit the woman inadvertently, and something happens with the woman. She either miscarries, or more likely, from the translation, she gives birth prematurely. And it says, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall be surely fined. So the one side, the pro-abortion side, pro-choice side, will say that the harm is, is in reference to the woman and not the child, because the child has been miscarried, is the translation they prefer. Uh, the harm is referenced to the woman, not the child, and therefore um, here a miscarriage is just, it, it just brings about a fine. Right? So a loss of that life just brings about a fine, not murder, like it would have if it was a life outside the womb. So they will say that life is less valuable inside the womb than outside because inside the womb, if a life is lost, it just requires a fine. Um, but the pro-life side... The more traditional Christian uh, side says the harm is not in reference just to the mother, but in reference to the child and the mother, maybe even specifically the child. And so it's saying if there's no harm to the child, you're being fined for threatening life. Um, and then naturally after that, if there is harm to the child, you shall pay life for life, tooth for tooth, etc. Um, so this is a very central passage because some will say that it devalues life, 
uh, because life inside the womb just requires a fine, they will say. And the other side says, no, actually, it's saying exactly what the pro-life side says, which is that if there is no harm, then you are fined for the threat of harming life. If there is harm to the baby, then there is life for life, just like there would be if the baby was outside of the womb. Okay? Um, the, on the opposition side, I've seen a few passages referenced. Numbers 3 is one of them where a census is being taken, and God instructs them to take only the babies who are a month old and upward into account for the census. And so they will say that this is because a, a baby shouldn't be counted as alive or count as fully human until a month after birth. That's what they'll say. So since this census is taken uh, for children only a month old being counted, specifically firstborn males, then firstborn males before that time shouldn't be considered as fully human. Okay, The most often passage that's cited by far by the opposition is Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 through 31. We're not going to look at the whole section for time, but I encourage you to do that. But the story is about a woman who is being accused of cheating on her husband, and she is then brought in front of the council, the, the, the priests, and it says this, If you have gone astray, then the Lord make you a curse when the Lord makes your thigh fall away and your womb swell. There's a translation difficulty there. Well, some will say that it literally means what it says, makes your thigh fall away and your womb swell. Um, but the other translation is, is uh, that that is a kind of a, um, a, a idiom for miscarriage. That he's saying that the Lord will make you miscarry. If you have slept with someone else who's not your husband then the, and have conceived, that then you will miscarry um, as a response to drinking this bitter water that the priest will give you. But if the woman has not defiled herself, she shall be free and shall conceive. Um, there's, we're going to spend a lot of time on this passage because it's a very significant one. But I just want you to know that one side, that the pro-choice side, will say that God here causes miscarriage causes abortion for a woman who has gone astray, so he cannot be against abortion because here he causes abortion. He causes them to drink water, and if they have gone astray, then their child will be aborted. Their child will die. Um, and then the other side says, well, we don't, we don't even know that, that that's what's occurring, that the punishment is miscarriage. It could be literally this sort of um, body swelling and whatever thigh falling away means, this, this harm to the physical body, probably... The other side will say it's in, it's in reference to the woman's womb will become barren, so she will not be able to produce children. Um, but if she is not guilty, she will still be able to produce children. So, um, And there's more to be said there, which we'll say, about God's prerogative versus man's prerogative to take life. Um, but this is, this is by far the most cited passage where non-Christians will say the Bible, or even Christians who, want, who are pro-abortion, pro-choice, will say that God is pro choice of pro-abortion because we see him instructing abortion in this case in Numbers chapter 5, instructing or at least causing miscarriage in this case by this poison or water that they would drink that would um, cause miscarriage, cause abortion. Okay, so we'll spend a lot of time looking at that in a future video, but I wanted you to, you to be presented with the passage that is central. And then also I saw there was one in particular um, that referenced Hosea 9.14 where um, the people of God and Hosea are crying out for, against their enemies, saying, Give them, O Lord, what you will give. Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Saying, uh, for the people of God, Hosea asking God to cause the wombs to miscarry, cause the, the, their babies to die, um, and that this is a reference to God being okay with these things, that God being the kind of God that causes miscarriages or, or, or abortions uh, in that sense. Okay. That is the uh, relevant verses that we're going to spend some time looking at in the future, especially Exodus 21, especially Numbers 5, um, to, to go along with a basic syllogism type argument that we'll look at for the Christian position. And we'll look at the, the I think, the stronger opposing arguments that deal with these biblical passages we've looked at and deal with the sort of more um, cultural uh, arguments that are made about a woman's right to her own body and... Um, woman's right to choose and how men don't have the ability and all those things. So we'll look at all those things in a future video, but I wanted to, just to kind of give a shorter video here presenting you with all the passages that are relevant to this, uh, this topic of whether or not uh, it's life in there and if it's the same value of human life and those things um, for us to set up, you know, to, to lay a foundation for us to build on in the future, to look back at these verses and study them more deeply. Okay. Love you. Talk to you soon.